All right, so we'll uh, transition into a quick panel discussion here, and um, hopefully uh, this will give you three different perspectives. I mean, you heard a really success successful entrepreneur who had had an exit and knew what to do with the rest of his life, which not many of us can claim, actually. So well done. Uh, congratulations on all your success. Thank you for all you're doing, um, you, know, uh, you know, to give back and to teach and uh, let others also benefit from your wisdom and experience. That is, that is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, I want to ask you, Raj, to kind of quickly give a brief background on your journey as an entrepreneur and um, you know, the exits that you have had, et cetera. Go ahead. So I'm in entertainment now. So this is, so it's like at the, are you familiar with the Cartoon Network? Are you familiar with Bugs Bunny? So at the Cartoon Network Awards, they ask, put Bugs Bunny on the stage, he's going to get this medal and they say, Bugs, tell us the story from the beginning. And this guy says, Bugs says, in the beginning the world was a ball of fire. And say, no, no, not that far back. <laughs> so it just depends on when you want to do it. So I'm an engineer MBA from India, worked for Tata's, came here uh, with Burroughs, saw the handwriting on the wall with mainframes going the way of the Neanderthals, and then jumped, started my own uh, tech company. And this was in 92. Uh, <clears throat> and this was when Indians didn't want CEOs. Indians weren't starting entrepreneurs. So, but somehow did it, nobody believed in us, so nobody gave us money, so we just bootstrapped it and kept the equity, which in hindsight wasn't a bad thing. So uh, we grew, we were in uh, tech services, project management, and then we quickly uh, pivoted into advanced technology. And then we got into some, <clears throat> met some defense people, and I've always been a geek. I would have been a physicist, but I, physicists didn't make money in Calcutta, so I went to do engineering. Engineering salaries were pathetic, I went to management, and then ultimately landed up as an entrepreneur. So, uh, so we got into eclectic technologies and we grew. We were on the Fortune 500 a number of times. In fact, same time as you guys were there on the thing. And uh, <clears throat> then ultimately we did, uh, I was the majority and uh, the only director of the company, but ultimately gave a lot of equity. We did a ESOP, a second stage ESOP, and finally sold to private equity. So that was the stage. Uh, and because it was the first company, so we went from zero to 90 million in like six years. So we really, really grew, and we're lucky. Then once I sold that, I, uh, <clears throat> I also had a flight simulator division where I built flight simulators in Albuquerque and Dallas. Who did you sell it to? What, what was it? The first company, who did you sell it to? So first ESOPs, and then to New Mountain Capital. Private equity. Yeah, private equity. In, so what we... Um, what also happened is I had a flight simulator division. We made Apache simulators, MH53G, uh, really fun stuff. And so we sold that, and I walked into the Smithsonian and talked to Admiral Engen, and I said, you got all these planes, and they are, you look at them and you say, ooh, ah, but you can't touch them. You can't get into them, and by golly, you can't ride them. So how about, I'm going to, I want to put a, simulator here, an entertainment simulator, and give them a feeling for flight. And he says, Raj, that's great, but I have no money, I'm a museum. I said, you know what, we want to do some fun. So I, I will fund putting it there, we'll charge a ticket, and I bet you people will buy this thing, you'll make a great revenue stream, and this company will make a living. He said, I'll try you out, and I had actually started that, I'd hired the team that did Star Tours for Disney in England, and we set up manufacturing capsule simulators there, and then we uh, created Pulseworks here to own and operate in the US. Because I, much like the annuity stream and the eat what you hunt and you kill model, that was selling simulators and entertainment stuff, but that sucked because it was a roller coaster ride. You know, the first sign of a recession, everything would, uh, people would put things on hold, and suddenly your whole organization had to shrink. <clears throat> so we got into farming, because we put these simulators to work, museums had traffic, 
We had constant streams of revenue. We could plan and we could grow. It was slower, more capital intensive, but very, very steady. So from that, we started Pulseworks. Today, Pulseworks is in 30 plus museums, including the Smithsonian Air and Space, the US Intrepid. In fact, I can say very, with a great deal of certainty that if you've been to a museum, bought a ticket and ridden a simulator, a capsule, an interactive simulator, or a virtual reality ride, or at the Georgia Aquarium, for instance, if you've done a VR, 90, 95 to 98% of the time, you'll be a customer of mine. All right. <laughs> So, Raj, how do you think about the question on exits, right? So, Deepak said, you know what, you should not be thinking about an exit. What are your thoughts? I mean, when do you start, as an entrepreneur, start thinking about an exit? So, the answer is really never. So, I have never thought about an exit. I've always thought if I build value, the whole idea was, so, if you don't build value, you have very limited options. They're very easy options. You know, you're not being successful, you're doing bad. They're painful, but the options are clear. But if you're successful and you build value, then you have multiple options. I have been lucky in the sense that all the companies I was with had no external funding. We did it ourselves, and we owned all of it, like Pulseworks, all of it, no debt. It's been profitable for years and growing. So I have a little different story than most of the models where people did go and get funding and then you've got somebody with a big stick saying, you've got EBITDA, you got this, have you met your quarters thing? Did you see these things? You told us you're gonna close in March, but now it's April and you know, it's something like this. And you get into this meaningless exercise and you spend so much time trying to raise money and I've done that because I've not done that, but I've advised people who are, who are trying to do that. Uh, or the other side of it is, <clears throat> your, the tail is wagging the dog. You can't be strategic. We can make mistakes, we can throw money at experiments, and it's the one or two out of 10 that succeed that create a whole new product line, that create a whole new business that's, so it's a little different. So, but exits do come to us. I started a, a visual effects studio. You know, I can do two companies at a time, not three, just two is fine. <laughs> and uh, so I started a visual effects studio and I did it with a couple of local people here, you, you're familiar with them. And we, uh, and I'd been wanting to do it for years, but I didn't have the time and the cost per artist seat was very high and there wasn't a commensurate market. For instance, if you remember, Silicon Graphics, Maya, and Wavefront were the, so the cost per an artist seat was like $120,000 in 97, 96, 97. And there wasn't an application, you could do simulators for technical stuff, but no widespread stuff till Jurassic Park came out. The moment Jurassic Park came out, you knew there was a huge market for CGI and visual effects, digital effects, and suddenly, and also consolidation happened. Silicon, Silicon Graphics went out of business, Maya and all these things became commercial tools, and now suddenly the whole industry changed. So have people approached you for acquisitions? So then what happened is one of our customers came to us okay. and said, we like you so much, we'd like to buy you. And so we, we actually went into a little thing about, do we want to sell so early? Do we want, all, all of us got together and we talked about it. But it was a big customer, and the day they approached us, as we were flying back from, uh, this was Sony Pictures, and so as we were flying back from LA, we get a call from Lucas's studio saying, we have a deal for you. I don't know how, either the Sony guys were testing us or there's an incestuous connection, but we get this, and we, so we're saying, should we play one against the other or not? But I think the decision was, it's Sony, you know? So, so, they, so early, is it? it so we, early. We, in hindsight, we sold early, but you know, it was a sale, it was a good thing. This was your first company? This was my third company. Third company, okay. Wow, okay, I lost count. 
<laughs> no, so here is, listen, I'm no, sorry. No, but this company they are not selling. Absolutely. So here's the thing though, right? I mean, I would say that if you have any external investors mm -hmm. or if you have employees on your um, cap table option pools. So no, no, hold on, hold on. Let me finish. Let me finish no, the question. Sorry. Okay. So in, in when you do have those, then I think you almost have to think about an exit. You have to think about how you are going to actually monetize uh, monetize those people who have trusted you obviously and are using that as one of the ways in which they're getting paid right so I think that that's that's something to be uh, to be thought about so uh, in my case let me quickly give my background and then we can jump into the specifics sure, if that's okay sure. yeah so um, many of you know my background but I founded a company that did tech work for uh, retail e-commerce companies I founded the company in 1994 um, I ran it for the first 21 years without getting any external um, yeah, people on the cap table, right? No external in investors and in fact, I think this was year two or year three and I had probably just had a, one, a very little revenue, right? Probably a couple of million dollars and I was looking to hire a sales guy and uh, he, he came, he, for the first time somebody in my life asked me this question, he said, what's your exit plan? And I said, what do, you, what do you mean? You mean you mean that door? You know, the, yeah, that's how I'm going to go home today. Is that what you're asking? Because that was my understanding of what an exit, exit plan is at the time. Uh, but more and more, right? I mean, I got to learn that. And you know, over a period of time, I had 3,000 employees. I did 14 acquisitions. And so basically, obviously, each time valuations had to be uh, encountered and dealt with. And um, probably at the end, I had like 20 or 25 execs, and all of them had employee stock options, probably either next level, probably either 50 or 60 had much smaller uh, stock options as well. So for their sake, I had to not just do um, valuations, even if it is, you know, arm's length just uh, based on current compa comparables, but based, uh, also had to think about how and when an exit can happen, right? I mean, because to give people paper and say, oh no, here this value is so much, well, so what, I can't eat that paper, right? So you got to kind of show them that. But then um, in 2015, uh, we finally brought in a PE company and uh, the private equity company uh, took 51% of the company. So I gave up control. But when they said 51%, I said, there's no way I'm going to give up 51%. I'll own 49% and I won't have control. That's, that's ridiculous. So they very kindly offered to do an LBO, which is essentially put debt on the company. But let me take it all off the table. So I was able to take 90% of the value off the table and still own 49% of the company, which in hindsight, they thought they were being smart actually, but um, it turned out to be great for me because three years later, uh, we sold the company to Cognizant uh, for a much, much higher multiple. Uh, really over 5x the enterprise price cost that uh, you know, I had received for the first half of it. And so I was still the second largest shareholder, so it was a second great outcome for me. And subsequently, I'm, I'm as you know, a VC. So I'm dealing with the uh, you know, valuation questions that somebody asked over there every day. Uh, so uh, yeah, so in terms of exits, in terms of valuations, uh, I think, again, I, I'm disagreeing with you guys a little bit, but I, I think that uh, as a business founder, you have to think about those. Even though I know that it's not really, should not be the mission or the sole mission to just make, quote unquote, make money. Um, but you have to think about it for the sake of your ecosystem partners and people who are who are in it. What do you think, Deepak? Well, so this the quirky reason of taking the company public. Um, this ties into that. So we had um, when we st um, it was just the five of us owning 100% of the business. We said employees are the main value in the company, so we created 20% pool that was owned by the employees. And the challenge as we grew became, what do the employees do with that stock? It's a private company, and, and our, the way our stock option plan was written by the attorneys, in order to monetize a stock option that somebody had, they had to actually quit. The only way they could get paid on the employee stocks that they owned was to quit. The company would buy the stock and pay them the money. That was a disincentive. I mean, we, the whole reason we did it is to keep employees, and now we're telling somebody that if you want to buy a house, or we, our employees were very young, so if somebody was having kids and they wanted to buy a house, they were forced to quit to monetize the stock option. So one of the key reasons we said we need to take this company public was actually to give value to those stakeholders that own part yeah, of the company. Absolutely. 
Um, so I agree with you. I mean, I, I, I'm just saying, if you focus on it overly, focus on it, then it's not the right thing. Yeah. But but it has to be in the back of your mind. Yeah. Raj, you want to add to that? No. So the first company, the reason we sold to an ESOP part of it, and then some more to the ESOP, was for exactly this reason, because we gave equity and there was no monetization method other than um, an exit. But we had such a fast growth in five years, we just shot up like a rocket that everybody was saying, why don't we wait a year? Why don't we wait a year? Because every time we, we went from like 500,000 to 2.5 million to 13 million to 40 to, I mean, we just went through. So it was very, it was, nobody was thinking about that. They were all eyes on the sky. I guess you didn't meet the investors in WeWork and those guys. Sorry? You didn't meet the investors in WeWork because they would have given you a great valuation, right? Even for <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. So, so it's true that ESOPs don't give you the best valuation. That's right. So, but it was more because we wanted the employees to become millionaires. So that was the whole idea is that if you give it, they'll become millionaires. So let's uh, if you give it, they'll become millionaires. Sorry, I was, yeah. Not, not so, bad. go ahead. No, so that was one case. So we had pressure to do something. But in the other cases, I found that depending on the business you're in, employees may not want equity. And unfortunately, we are in a very simple business where we put these things out and we have a group of very talented wizards who create all this. And, but our force was young, they are not thinking of stuff. But at some point, if we have an exit, I know that they will, they know that Raj will take care of them. So that's the kind of loyalty that we have uh, do you think that they don't? It's I mean, very I, unique. It's very ours is a very unique. Case. So let me ask very you a question on that. So this was this happened in my case. I gave out stock options to my employees while my company was, I mean, probably about three, four years before the PE company came in. So I used to always hear the. I mean, they nobody believed that they would ever be able to monetize it. Now, do, do you see that? Do you think that's one of the reasons why people don't want stock options because they don't believe that Raj will ever sell it? So we, we did have a plan that we will make it valuable through an ESOP okay. because then you get money because of your, you know, the way the thing is structured. But in the other case, sometimes when the, the kind of people we have, like for instance in Pulseworks, they are more interested in compensation, bonuses. We give a lot of cash compensation that's very, very... Uh, valuable to people and we keep people. So it's, that, that's, it's, it's just, I tried giving stock, I tried giving options, and people would say, what am I going to do with this boss? It's not, not, it's not going to happen. Exactly. And so, so finally we bought those things back and we started giving them a lot of cash. So your business is mostly cash flow business, is that right? Our, our business is a lot of cash flow because yeah. we get money before they ride. Exactly. So that, that, that then makes that sense. makes sense. Yeah. So, okay, now let's get to that's the next true. phase. It's, it's a different model, completely. So while you have, you said you have sold what, three businesses, you said? Yeah. Three businesses. So for the three businesses, what kind of preparation did you make for the exit or did you kind of sort of, it, or did it just happen or, or what are the best practices that you think should be? Uh, for so one of the things that we did, which is not with an exit in mind, but with the fact that we needed to have good people in place. So I've always worked to try to work myself out of a job. Sufficient. Yeah. yeah, so that if I have a team that can go do it, and I always believe that you cannot have the old triangular method of, you know, Moses on the mountain coming down with slabs of stone with the Ten Commandments, and everybody, you know, laboring minions at the bottom of the pyramid, and if you get in the way, these slabs of stone will crush you, that is not a sustainable model, and this was when we started in 93, 92. Because the triangle grows and collapses under its own weight. I'm being allegoric and metaphorical, but you, you get the gist of it. The other model that I really believe in is that where it's an upward triangle with the CEO standing at the side or the founder standing at the side being the coach, and it's open-ended and the people who, where the rubber meets the road is open-ended and growing. 
and you want to do it in a way that when you walk away, the people say they did it themselves. So you're never missed. So what about, did you think getting an audit done, you think that helps with an exit? What are the things that helps you with an exit? I think keeping very good financials does help. Having immaculate records and being very, very straightforward and honest to the penny. So I think that's an important part so you can go back and tell anybody that, hey, this is so easy to verify. Yeah, I would say I agree. Uh, so f one of the first things you've got to do is what is, my, what is the structure of my organization? Am I going to create it as an LLC? Am I going to create it as a sole proprietorship? Am I going to create it as a C Corp? Um, so those kinds of, that, so those decisions are important and they have long lasting um, effects that can, if, if you make a wrong decision seven years before you have your exit, when you're at the exit, it could create a lot of headache. So when you, way before the exit, you got to really look at, do I have the right structure of the organization, number one. Number two, uh, as Raj said, the, the books have to be squeaky clean. And so we, we used to have audits done when we didn't need to have audits done just to make sure that we were confident everything was clean and in the future we won't have any issues. Okay, so you know, um, the process that my company followed, I followed during my exit from my first company um, was somewhat classical, meaning like you guys really, I hadn't thought about an exit for a really long time for the first several years of my company. And then um, when I started thinking about it, um, it happened mostly because I had a CFO who came from a really large publicly traded company uh, in the city and he looked at the financials and he said, he, he was an m and guy, so United 14 Acquisitions, he was helping with that. But he said that, listen, I mean, I don't know if you know or not, but you know you can take out a lot of money every year because I was putting it all back into the business. And I said, well, I mean, I don't need the money. I'd rather let the business grow. So he said, but you know, you can do this for the next several years, you can take a lot of money out. Or if you want, you can try to get an exit. I said, oh, okay, we can, we can look at that option. Because you know, it, was, it was largely a services business, it was like being on a treadmill. So I, um, we decided to do that. So we brought in a team uh, that built the metrics, built, built a deck. We had been doing audits, by the way, for I think seven or eight years prior to that. So we had all that audited and um, and then when we, when we did and uh, we went and did a roadshow in probably about six, seven cities, really all over the world, uh, definitely in the Bay Area and Boston, New York and Chicago and Bombay and so on. And then um, essentially probably about 70 to 80 uh, PE companies, mostly growth equity and even mess lenders, uh, because we were figuring out what's the vehicle that we want to use. And eventually we got LOIs from about a dozen or so of them and um, picked really, you know, the highest valuation and also saw if there's a cultural fit, et cetera. And that's really, uh, so you guys, so what, what was the process that you followed, Deepak, in terms of, you, you described it with the bankers and, uh, you know, this advice they gave you which you rejected, but eventually you did go public. So how did you eventually get to that? Um, so the, va the valuation component or what? No, the exit itself. I mean, the IPO itself. What was the process? Similar to what you mentioned, the IPO process is you get these bankers, um, they prepare the documents, they prepare the S-1, you file it to the SEC, and then you, um, the, the bankers underwrite the public offering of the shares. So they guarantee a certain price. So then they will take you on roadshows to meet with uh, buy-side investors all over the country, uh, create the demand, drum up the demand, and then you, you take the company public. We were listed at $15 a share, um, about four million shares, I think, were issued at that time, and uh, they were uh, the bankers paid us 15 bucks a share. We closed uh, day one uh, in the public market at uh, 22 dollars. We opened at like 26 or something, closed at 22. Ooh. So they make the differential between the 15 and 22 is their profit for underwriting it. Okay. So uh, last question. So post exit. Right, so you were associated, you're still associated with the board, that's awesome. Uh, what are the other ways in which to think about a career or about your career, about your life post an exit? Because, you know, as entrepreneurs, you really get attached to your business, it becomes your identity, right? And so how do you, I mean, in fact, with me, people called me as though somebody in my family had died, 
right? and said, oh, you know, no longer with the business, oh, what happened? And I said, no, I, I'm, I'm happy, you know. It was a great event, but uh, what are your I thoughts? Can, I can, that's, <clears throat> that's a very real feeling, but I had the opposite experience. When you're the sole owner and the only director of the company and you sell it, even to an ESOP and you have people sharing power, it's very different. So I was to the point where you've got teenagers who have grown up, now they're driving the car, and I didn't even want to be in the back seat. So it was really, I was like, you know what? You are done. There's a nicer word for it, but it's not appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> and so I let it ride, but I had very good people. So that was a good thing. And I would go for board meetings or shareholder meetings, but I wasn't, I just was out. Because I said, it's, it's just too hard, it's so different when you make all the decisions, you're the ultimate, and then now you're sharing power. Maybe it was because I, this was my first company and first we had been so successful and I was so confident I could do it, you know. But yeah, that, that, is, that was hard. So for a long time I didn't even talk about what I did because it was like, I'm done with it, and then started all these other things. Deepak? Yeah, to me, um, I've had to go through layers and layers and layers of that process and continuing to learn and tweak and stuff as it went along. So it went from being in the company and making all the decisions, and even though I was not CEO, neither one of our first two CEOs when I was still at the company would ever make even a semi-important decision without my consult consulting me and my buy-in. So I was very, very involved in driving the ship. Um, when, you, when, this, uh, when the first CEO was hired, when I was no longer in that company, that's when I had to really learn the hard way how he perceived my involvement in things. And I had to take a step back and understand there were limits to my influence of the company. And secondly, the influence that I had in the company was dependent on how I approached the question. So I could still raise the question, but how I raised it was really important. When I raised it was really important. Sometimes you let things simmer in your head. You hear an employee call and unload on you with a lot of things, and you let a week pro go by when you're processing all that, and then at the next opportunity you get to talk about something like that, you can try to move the, move the needle, and it works much better that way. Um, the, um, one of our directors used to say, that, um, you know, and, and I think one of the things that we have done really well at Manhattan Associates, the board has made all the important decisions really, really well. I've seen other companies fail, other CEOs exit, and the companies really struggle based on a lot of friction between the management and the board. And our board has really understood when we have to step in and, and make a call and make a change, and when we have to uh, hold back and let things play out and just be a council and a sounding board. Um, we have we've figured out how to do that really well and that one thing that captures that is one of our directors who's no longer at the company now but he was one of the early directors he used to say you know you don't want to get a dog and then bark for it right you let the dog do the barking so he used to say when you hire a CEO let them do their job you don't do it for them but you want to make sure that they are behaving like you, you like you want to make sure your dog is behaving so that's, that's the role of the board. <laughs> that's Thank a great you. promotion for all you would-be CEOs. Yeah, no, now yeah. you know where CEO heaven is. <laughs> it's four-legged. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks, guys. Guys, a round of applause for this wonderful panel. A couple of questions, if anybody has any questions. Thank you, wonderful conversation. Um, one question I have is these days companies are choosing to stay private for longer. Of course, private equity has a role to play in that. So from a founder per perspective, valuations being equal, let's say, for an event like that, do you have a bias towards IPO versus uh, private equity and pros and cons? Any of you for that matter? What was the last part of the question? I couldn't hear. Pros and cons associated with going IPO versus taking private equity funding. I, I, I can. I can. No, no, no. I got it. I got it. 
So, uh, see, uh, it depends on what time of, I mean, what is, what is going on in the market. So, when Manhattan went public, at the time it was a lot easier to go public. Yeah, it was a lot less expensive to go public. Uh, it was stylish to go public, right? Um, then, because of our uh, good friends at Enron and uh, you know companies like that, and Worldlink and Satyam and all that, um, you know there are all these things like the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which have made it extremely uh, expensive in terms of reporting requirements, uh, meaning seven-figure number of dollars every year to meet those requirements, the reporting requirements that are needed uh, according to those. So. I would say that today, in today's environment, larger and larger companies are choosing to remain private. Um, and, you know, some of it is, you know, again, there was in the middle this whole thing with SPACs and so on and so forth. Um, but in general, I think that is the case uh, with significant revenues in, uh, you know, in the olden days with, you know, double digit million number of revenues, people would go public, but not anymore. Uh, so I think, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. Um, I think uh, at Manhattan Associates, I feel like we have had the best of both worlds where we are a public company, but we have um, maybe about 10 institutional investors that own a vast majority of the shares and they really like us and they are long-term holders. Um, so we don't get a lot of uh, churn in the market and we get the stability that we want from a uh, private equity model, if you will, but, uh, but we're still publicly traded. So all the benefits of the public market is there. I think, I think all things being equal, a public market is better because of nothing other than the fact that there is liquidity for shareholders. So. But there's a, what's also fuel this thing, like if you look at Stripe or any of these companies that came out from Y Combinator, they've grown privately because there's two reasons. One is there's so much large pools of funds that are being invested in these companies when they are private. And the second part is there's a huge secondary market for executives and others who want to sell their stock at a discount. So you can sell private stock and there are actually organizations that do it. So what's, uh, what's become unfortunate is that when they are unleashed to the public in an IPO, their upside is limited because they've already factored in all of this thing. Look at Snowflake, look at all Slootman stuff, look at all of that. It's, it's a different racket now than when it was earlier when it went into the public, the public bought into it and could ride Microsoft all the way up. But it's different today. And there are companies that have gone public and then have been taken back private, as we know. And That's the other side. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, um, I don't think we have any time. Or, or should we? We're good? Sorry for being a little late today, too, guys. We appreciate it. Yeah, and sure. Huge round of applause for the panel today.